Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Eric Torin. I'm the Senior Vice President for the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. And I wanna welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, the webinar today is sponsored by the American College of Veterinary Medicine, Preventive Medicine and its partner organizations, the American Association of Food Safety and Public Health Veterinarians, the National Association of Federal Veterinarians, and the U.S. Animal Health Association. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kaylee Pettit, who is a representative from the ACVPM Continuing Education Committee. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you once again for joining us for this webinar. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Chris Akis Robertson Hale. Uh, Rear Admiral Kiss Robertson Hale is a Deputy Assistant Administrator of the USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Services Office of Public Health Science and serves as the agency's Chief Public Health Veterinarian. In these roles, she oversees the science behind FSIS's regulatory agenda and represents the agency in One Health engagements. She has worked in multiple offices within the agency, including the Office of Field Operations. In 2008, she joined the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer, and in 2010, she was assigned to the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene as a CDC Preventative Medicine Fellow. Her educational background includes a Bachelor of Science in the from the Georgia Institute of Technology, a DVM from Tuskegee University, and an MPH from the University of Minnesota. She's also board certified in veterinary preventative medicine. As a flag officer in the Commission Corps of the U.S. Public Health Service, she is also an assistant surgeon general. Rear Admiral Hale has received numerous awards and recognitions. In 2018, she received the James H. Steele One Health Outstanding PHS Veterinary Career Award. And in 2019, she was named an honorary diplomat of the American Veterinary Epidemiolo Ep Epidemiology Society for Outstanding Contributions to One Health. Dr. Hale, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And it, it's great to present today. And I'm going to try my level best to keep the audience's attention. I know it's the end of the day, at least for folks on the, on the East Coast. Um, so we're going to be talking about FSIS's um, Salmonella Initiative. And I am okay here. So hopefully everyone um, knows who FSIS is already. We are the um, agency within the USDA that regulates the safety of meat, poultry, and egg products and ensures that they're um, wholesome and properly labeled. FSIS employs a workforce of almost 9,000, um, and the vast majority of our employees are frontline meaning their work is conducted in an, an FSIS regulated facility or an FSIS laboratory. A large proportion of our frontline employees are public health veterinarians and they are responsible for overseeing antemortem and postmortem slaughter inspection activities. To truly um, appreciate FSIS's impact, it helps to have these statistics in mind. Every year, meat harvested from 162 million head of livestock and almost 10 billion birds receives FSIS inspection. Um, this meat not only goes into the domestic food supply, but it's a significant source of protein for the rest of the world, as the United States is a major exporter of meat and poultry products. Additionally, FSIS also inspects almost 3 billion pounds of processed eggs. So that includes liquid um, eggs, dried egg products. Our frontline workforce conducts almost 8 million inspection tasks per year, and that's rain, snow, or shine, pandemic, or no pandemic. All right, so this is the point in the presentation when I, I kind of have to pretend that nobody on the call knows what salmonella is. So please bear with me as I over explain a bit about salmonella. Um, salmonella is a, a genus of rod shaped gram negative bacteria of the family Enterobacteriaceae. And when we talk about salmonella, usually we're talking about salmonella enterica. That, that's the species that we're referring to. Um, within enterica are serotypes that are grouped into two categories, non-typhoidal and and typhoidal. Um, the typhoidal serotypes such as typhi 
are associated with human to human transmission. Um, and that's, that's due to the fact that humans can act as asymptomatic carriers. And typhoid Mary or Mary Malin is the most infamous example of that type of, of spread. But in the world of food safety, we're generally talking about non-typhoidal salmonella. That's not only the most interesting kind, but it's also the most relevant to food safety because these serotypes colonize the gastrointestinal tract of animals, including food animals, and can cause public health problems when they contaminate the water or food supply. Salmonella is an intracellular pathogen, as evident in the picture shown here, um, which shows the bacteria inserting itself into mucosal cells. Um, once the pathogen enters the gastrointestinal mucosa, the integrity of the gut is compromised and the result is gastroenteritis that can range in severity depending on the virulence of the infecting strain, the exposure dose, and the susceptibility of the host to that particular strain. Foodborne transmission is the most common route of infection. So last November, some of you may recall that Dr. Lonnie King uh, gave a webinar on One Health for the Council for Agricultural Science and Technology series. And um, in his talk, he described the concept of a wicked problem. This is a concept that's it's been around for a while, actually, it's been used since the 70s and, and most often refers to very complex social problems that are ser serious enough to merit, merit policy solutions. Um, a University of Pittsburgh professor by the name of John Camillus rather uh, succinctly described wicked problems as, as those that um, are, um, have, have numerous causes, they're, they're tough to explain or define, and there's no um, right answer to them. I would um, amend that to say there's, there's no clear single right answer to them, but regardless of, of semantics, um, a wicked problem is, is one that's gonna be intractable to conventional tools and approaches. In the world of public health, I'd say salmonella comes pretty darn close to one of these wicked problems. And, um, and we should address it using a One Health approach. Why is it a One Health issue? First, animal reservoirs of salmonella are both common and numerous. The pathogen's ubiquity in the ecosystem greatly complicates efforts to keep livestock and poultry free from colonization. You have insects, you have rodents, birds, other wildlife, and there are no strangers to farms, even farms that have fairly robust biosecurity programs. Um, so as long as there are opportunities for food animals to interact with infected critters, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna see salmonella popping up in, in the food animals. Secondly, food animals experience clinical and subclinical infections of salmonella. So when food animals get sick, we know that productivity goes down. And when productivity goes down, we know that farmers lose money. And from this reality emerges a strong business case for controlling salmonella on farm. But what happens when animals are merely colonized with salmonella? They don't get ill and therefore productivity is not noticeably impacted. Well, then there's gonna be significant significantly less pressure for producers to invest in on-farm salmonella controls, especially ones that are expensive. In poultry, um, and, th and that's, um, that's gonna be the, the focus of this presentation is poultry, salmonella overwhelmingly is a commensal organism and illness is generally limited to chicks and immunocompromised adults. We should also remember the role that the environment plays in salmonella transmission. The pathogen can contaminate soil and water. It can make its way onto animal feed um, and in produce grown from hu from hu for human consumption. It can also latch onto farm equipment and other surfaces in the production environment, leading to the persistence of certain strains flock after flock after flock. We can't talk about salmonella as a one health issue without acknowledging the public health burden it causes. CDC estimates 1.4 million cases of human salmonellosis occurs per year in the United States. 
uh, leading to uh, 6,500 hospitalizations and 420 deaths. So that's nothing to sneeze at. This graph shows human incidence of salmonella infections in the United States between 1996 and 2019. And the great big takeaway is that incidence has been fairly static over the last 25 years, despite substantial efforts within the food safety community to reduce foodborne salmonellosis. Our lack of progress in making an observable dent in human salmonella infections has driven FSIS to reassess its current salmonella reduction strategy. Another driver is the fact that poultry is a leading source of human salmonella infections. The most current source attribution estimates from the Interagency Food Safety Analytics Collaboration, or IFSAC, tells us that approximately 23% of foodborne salmonella illnesses are attributable to poultry consumption. Now let's talk a little bit about foodborne outbreaks. Of those investigated by FSIS in recent years, almost half were caused by salmonella. And of these outbreaks, chicken was suspected or implicated as the source in 43%, making it the most common FSIS regulated commodity associated with salmonella outbreaks. These 12 outbreaks involved over 800 illnesses, nearly 200 hospitalizations and three deaths. Chicken commercially sold as raw was the product of interest in over 80% of these FSIS investigated outbreaks. So I already talked at length about why salmonella is a problem that merits a One Health approach, but I'd like to elaborate some more on the attributes that make it a complex challenge, especially for a regulatory agency that has charged itself with improving its salmonella reduction strategy. The serotypes within Salmonella enterica are highly diverse. There are over 2,500 distinct serotypes and they differ from one another in a number of ways. One important one being host range. Some serotypes such as Typhromerium um, have a relatively broad host range. And this is why you can see Typhromerium and um, other um, serotypes showing up in cattle, swine, poultry, um, wildlife. And then there's other serotypes such as enteritidis that show a clear preference for poultry and other avian species. Salmonella also behaves differently in poultry than it does in other food animals with bird to bird transmission occurring vertically and horizontally. Transoviral transmission occurs um, um, more frequently by some serotypes more than others. And, and once again, Salmonella enteritidis as a standout in this regard, it's the primary um, offender of transovarial transmission from hen to chick. Um, so given what we know about these, these types of serotype differences, one might assume that advances in whole genome sequencing would allow us to move away from classifying salmonella by a serotype and it's instead classify strains based on their potential to cause human illness. And just epidemiologically, I mean, we can kind of infer that there are going to be differences between serotypes and strains um, because we see that the same serotypes show up time and time again in human illness and they don't always map to the serotypes that we see in food animals. So Salmonella Kentucky is a great example. We frequently isolate Kentucky from, from chicken it's one of the more common serotypes in chicken, but then when you look in CDC PulseNet, that serotype is rarely associated with human illness. And so that tells us just on the face of it that there's something about Kentucky that makes it less likely uh, to cause human illness. Alas, it is difficult though to, um, to say that you know, what genes matter most when defining strains of public health concern. We haven't yet established a scientific consensus on what genetic markers allow us to predict with some confidence pathogenicity and virulence. Um, we're working on it, but we just haven't reached that yet. So until we reach that understanding, 
serotypes appear to be as granular as we can go in terms of regulatory policy that moves beyond treating all salmonella the same way. And that's our current posture. That's been our posture for, for years now is that all salmonella are regulated the same way. And then finally, it bears mentioning that salmonella, just like any other organism on the planet, is constantly evolving. And sometimes these evolutionary changes can negatively affect public health. A good example is the rapid emergence of multi-drug resistant salmonella infantis over the last 10 years or so. It's now the leading serotype in chicken. And um, only a few years ago, it was barely present in, in chicken. Human illnesses are also um, caused by this pathogen in, in a, in a, at a prevalence that we didn't see just 10 years ago. So where did this come from? Um, what has allowed this particular serotype to flourish in poultry to the extent that it has? And what selective pressures may uh, contributed to this? We're still working on getting answers to these questions, but one thing is clear. This is not the first time developments such as this one have occurred, and it's likely to be the last. So this is a reality we also have to, to keep in mind, and it's also a reality that challenges us. But that's not all, okay? Uh, chicken consumption is rising, and it's not showing any indication of, of slowing down. If you look at the yellow line in this graph, you'll see that over the last uh, 50, 60 years or so, chicken consumption has, has dramatically climbed. Um, and you don't see that trend with any other um, meat source. So what this, this means is that if salmonella contamination um, in raw poultry, even if it was to, to stay the same or even decrease, as long as exposure um, human exposure is rising, we, we very well might see an increase in illnesses because of those exposures. And from a public health standpoint, we have to care about that because, you know, it, it means our illness burden is increasing, okay? So that's another challenge for us. Okay, so I'm going to talk about where, where we um, internally are thinking about going the few, for the future of our, of our regulatory strategy. But before I get into that, I do think it would be a great idea to talk about you know, what has led up to this point um, historically. So I'll give a quick overview of where we've come from. So PR HACCP rule, what does that stand for? That is the pathogen reduction slash hazard analysis and critical control point. This is um, a set of regulations that were published in 1996 that radically changed the way the meat and poultry industry was regulated. It required press processors to develop and implement HACCP plans for preventing biological, chemical, and physical hazards from entering the food supply. With this rule, F FSIS shifted its responsibilities towards verifying regulatory compliance rather than prescribing the actions the industry should take to be compliant with the regulations. And product sampling became an important means by which FSIS verified establishment HACCP plans were effective. FSIS's pathogen reduction strategy is closely tied to the verification testing that we do and the establishments that we regulate. Almost 100,000 product samples every year are collected in slaughter and processing establishments. And what do we test products for? Well, in raw poultry, we're looking for the presence of salmonella and also campylobacter. Data obtained from these product samples allows FSIS to assess establishments against what we call performance standards. Since 1998, FSIS has applied salmonella performance standards to raw meat and poultry products. However, only raw poultry is currently subjected to standards. Performance standards are developed based on risk assessments that take into account industry-wide prevalence estimates and goals set by the Healthy People Food Safety Working Group. 
standards enable FSIS to verify establishments are consistently controlling salmonella contamination and are subject to consequences when they do not consistently control salmonella contamination. These consequences are primarily market-based. By categorizing establishments by their performance history and making this information public on our website, FSIS is able to use market pressure to promote contamination control within the industry. And this table shows the current salmonella performance standards for the five major classes of raw poultry. Establishments that have a salmonella positive rate that is higher than the standard or exceeds the standard, those establishments are placed in category three and are subjected to FSIS follow-up activities such as increased sampling and also food safety assessments. The establishments with rates well below the standard, um, in other words, they're, they're doing well with controlling hazards or microbial hazards, those are establishments are placed in category one and those that are in the middle are placed in category two. Since FSIS has applied these performance standards, we've seen a significant decline in salmonella contamination in raw poultry and ground beef. And you can see that in this graph. Um, just as an FYI, the small peaks noted by the arrows um, here they represent sampling changes that led to greater salmonella recovery in our tested samples, but they don't reflect true incident, in, I'm sorry, true increases in contamination. So just be aware of that. Um, from this, we can conclude that performance standards have helped reduce the prevalence of salmonella in raw poultry. However, we must remember that the declining trend in salmonella contamination on raw poultry and other meat does not match the flat trend in human illness. And so this is the same graph I showed earlier. Um, when you overlay that with the uh, targets for Healthy People 2020 and also 2030 is the same target, you'll see that um, you know, there's a disconnect here. We have not reached our goals for redu reducing foodborne salmonellosis. And our lack of progress in doing this suggests that while our current performance standard approach has been effective in lowering the overall prevalence of salmonella, it may be insufficient to achieving real measurable public health gains. And that's really what we wanna do. Okay, so this brings us up to the present. Um, in October, 2021, we officially announced in a press release issued by uh, Secretary Vilsack our intent to revise our strategy for controlling salmonella contamination and poultry to more effectively reduce foodborne illnesses. We are taking on this challenge using a comprehensive approach that has been very deliberative and has involved significant engagement with various partners and stakeholders within the food safety and scientific community. And then in November of last year, we held a public meeting to gather stakeholder feedback on the framework under consideration. And I'm going to talk about that framework in the, in the next slides. Um, approximately 500 people attended the public meeting and we heard comments from a variety of experts in academia, consumer advocacy groups, industry, and the general public. Attendees provided important feedback on approaches to testing birds before slaughter, options for monitoring indicator organisms and pathogens throughout the slaughter process, um, and the advantages and challenges of quantitative and serotype-based product standards. FSIS has taken a, a look at those comments and we'll be taking a look at the impact of the proposed um, or con uh, contemplated framework on small, very small establishments. Um, we are making a point to look at all the comments and factor in um, those viewpoints as, as we develop what, what we will be proposing, hopefully sometime soon. Um, it's still a work in progress. All right, so the, the framework. Let's talk about that. The framework, which does not 
I have to emphasize this does not represent a formal proposal. We have yet to formally propose anything. Um, it just represents at high level, a three pronged set of industry requirements that we are contemplating. And these requirements include requiring in incoming flocks to be tested for salmonella before entering a slaughter establishment, enhancing establishment process control, monitoring and FSIS verification, and implementing an enforceable, enforceable final product standard. And this um, just represents an illustration of what we're trying to put in place. Um, Emphasizes regulatory jurisdiction is limited to slaughter and processing plants. We also have a role in distribution facilities, but for the most part, our jurisdiction is where those brackets are, slaughter and processing. It does not extend pre-harvest. But salmonella or originates at pre-harvest, right? So slaughter establishments that have a system in place to minimize salmonella contamination in incoming birds should have an easier time ensuring the food that exits the system is safe for the consumer. And FSIS wants to put in place a framework that promotes the development of such systems. All right, so I'm gonna talk through each of the components of the framework. Um, just so you can kind of get an insight into our, our thinking. Uh, component one concerns requirements for incoming flock testing for salmonella. Currently, poultry slaughter establishments are required to conduct a hazard analysis and maintain HACCP plans to address identified hazards. We do not require slaughter plants to conduct any testing of incoming flocks, um, and that's for any pathogens or any other contaminants. We don't require that at, at that stage of, of the slaughter process. The contemplated framework seeks to change the status quo by requiring slaughter plants to furnish evidence upon a request that incoming flocks have been tested for salmonella. And the rationale for this is twofold. Testing would help promote the use of pre-harvest intervention that reduce incoming contamination or mitigate the risk of a particular serotype from entering the establishment. And two, if a flux documented salmonella load does not meet a predetermined target at receiving, then this allows the establishment to take certain actions to mitigate the risk that that final product might pose to the consumer. Component two seeks to strengthen requirements for process control monitoring. Uh, currently, poultry slaughter establishments are required to conduct microbial testing to monitor process control. This testing can include salmonella testing, but usually the industry uses indicator organisms such as generic E. coli um, or aerobic um, bacteria to assess log reduction between two points in the process. This allows establishments to monitor the effectiveness of antimicrobial interventions in reducing microbial contamination on the carcass. The contemplated framework does not seek to change this requirement very drastically, but it does seek to better define the parameters for process control um, and, and, and specify this in our guidance. And we envision that this will help the industry improve pathogen control. And then finally, component three consists of finished product standards. As I explained earlier, FSIS currently uses product standards or pathogen um, performance standards to promote industry-wide pathogen reduction. But it's important to note that failing to meet the performance standards does not lead to enforcement action. Salmonella is not currently recognized as an adulterant and raw poultry products. The contemplated framework seeks to change the status quo by requiring establishments to meet enforceable product standards for salmonella. This would make salmonella an adulterant for certain types or subtypes of salmonella or when it's present at certain and or when it's present at certain levels in finished product. Okay, so that was a lot, I know. Um, so let's talk a little bit about adulteration and what goes into that. 
um, that determination. When FSIS deems a meat or poultry product adulterated, it has to be able to make a legal case for doing so. And the language here is taken from the Federal Meat Inspection Act and the Poultry Products Inspection Act. Um, if a quote unquote poisonous or, or deleterious substance um, is added to a food product, i.e. it's not naturally present, then you can safely argue that this substance is an adulterant and thus renders that food unfit for human consumption. But if a substance is naturally present, then the only way you can really call it adulterated is, um, or an adulterant is if the qua quantity of the substance renders the food injurious to health. Um, so for component three of the contemplated framework, we, we consider our ability to show salmonella as an adulterant within the meaning of the PPIA to be quite critical, okay? There are other questions FSIS has to satisfy if it's to be successful on deeming salmonella an adulterant. So some of you long timers may remember years ago when FSIS declared certain serotypes of sheba toxin producing E. coli adulterants in raw ground beef. When this was decided, it established precedents that will likely play a role in how salmonella is assessed currently from a legal standpoint. When FSIS determined that certain s are adulterants, the agency identified characteristics associated with both the pathogen and the product that distinguished them from other raw products contaminated with other pathogens. So specifically, back in 1994, FSIS noted that exposure to E. coli 0157H7 had been linked with serious life-threatening human illnesses such as hemorrhagic colitis and hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS. In addition, FSIS noted that only small numbers of E. coli 0157H7 could cause illness. Mm -hmm. And because of this low infectious dose, FSIS also noted that 0157 can be spread from person to person, as had been reported in, in daycare settings. So the agency concluded from all of that, that the, the raw ground beef presents a significant public health risk. Um, and also this is an important factor too, raw ground beef is frequently consumed after being prepared in a manner that does not reliably destroy the pathogen. So you, we, we all know that hamburgers are often cooked rare. And so that is also a relevant factor to deeming Aztec and adulterant and raw ground beef. So all of these factors were integral to making the case for deeming Aztec and adulterant and raw ground beef and making this case for salmonella and raw poultry will require equally strong scientific evidence. And this is the work that has been done or is currently being done to uncover relevant scientific um, evidence. Engagement with various partners and stakeholders has been a key thrust of this initiative and FSIS has actively sought insight from the scientific community to shape its thinking. FSIS has also engaged in an enormous amount of scientific work to inform the strategy it will ultimately propose. In February of last year, we held a science roundtable that showcased the latest research on several topics including salmonella controls at pre-harvest, biomapping at slaughter using indicator organisms and salmonella, um, and the ecology of salmonella serotypes along the production chain. Last year, we also started work on a, on a risk profile on salmonella subtypes associated with poultry associated outbreaks. And this involved an extensive literature review that um, fortunately we were able to do um, in partnership with the National Agricultural Lab Library. Um, and this risk profile was um, externally peer reviewed late last year and is currently going through agency clearance. FSIS is also conducting two quantitative microbial risk assessments focused on salmonella and raw chicken and turkey, uh, data from exploratory sampling in addition to data from FSIS's most current um, uh, poultry baseline studies are important sources of data used in these risk assessments. 
um, and we recently submitted the risk assessments to an external peer review as well, and are um, working on um, responding to uh, the comments that we received. In 2021, we engaged the National Advisory Committee on Microbiological Criteria for Food and charged them with answering a set of questions to help inform FSIS's um, way of looking at enhancing salmonella control in poultry. And their report was recently finalized and will be uh, published in, in the Journal of Food Protection, hopefully later this year. Also, um, we started and completed a six month exploratory sampling project to collect additional data on chicken carcasses. And in this data study, we sampled carcasses um, at two points in the slaughter process, rehang and um, post chill, which is our standard specimen, specimen for um, verifying uh, process control. And uh, we analyzed these samples for salmonella and indicator organisms to collect data that can help us understand salmonella levels and also uh, log reduction of microbial um, organisms in the slaughter process. Our ability to quantify levels of salmonella in raw poultry products will play a role in our ability to declare products adulterated at certain levels of contamination. So I'll quickly talk about some of the things that we learned from our exploratory poultry sampling. Like I said, we conducted two point sampling, looking at salmonella levels and also looking at indicator organisms. And for those that aren't familiar with what rehag means, basically just imagine, you know, um, you know, your poultry, your typical poultry line at slaughter, rehang would be the point right before evisceration you have a, a, a carcass that's been defeathered. Um, you know, the head has been taken off, the feet and everything, but the carcass has yet to um, be eviscerated. Um, and then after evisceration, the carcass will enter the chill step and it will spend some time in usually in a, in a, chill, a chill tank and then um, removed from the chiller. Um, and that's where the post chill sample comes from. Okay. So what we wanted to see is, you know, how the um, ecology of salmonella changes from those two points. How um, do the indicators um, organisms look in terms of log reduction and also how do salmonella levels look from those two points? And what we learned was is that at Rehang, um, a majority of the samples are positive for salmonella. And that's not too surprising, but it's a little bit higher than what we saw when we did our last uh, poultry baseline, um, I guess it was over, over 10 years ago now. Um, so that was a little surprising, um, but we did see relatively low levels of salmonella, um, low prevalence of salmonella in carcasses at post chill. Other findings included, um, you know, indicator um, performance. So on average, rehang indicator counts were reduced to the limits of detection at post chill, which means that um, the interventions at, at the chill step were really effective in bringing down contamination, microbial contamination levels from rehang to post chill. Um, for salmonella serotypes, what we saw was a broader range of serotypes in rehang samples versus post chill. Um, in the rare, rare times when we were able to isolate salmonella from both the uh, post chill sample and its corresponding rehang sample, um, we saw that the majority of the time it was the same serotype. And then also with respect to enumeration, we found that the vast majority of all samples, rehang and post chill, um, had such a low level of contamination that we weren't able to see detectable um, levels. But um, 18 of the rehang samples did have detectable levels of salmonella um, when we enumerated them and um, about 16% of the post chill samples did. So what that tells us is that even when a sample is, is, is positive for salmonella, it's generally at a very, very low level, at a level so, so low that our, our current um, method for detecting or quantifying salmonella, which is a qPCR method, 
is not sensitive enough uh, to record a value. Okay, and um, more on serotypes. So as I said, you know, um, there there were there was some correspondence between what we saw in the paired samples with respect to to um, to serotypes. The three serotypes that I've circled here are of of public health interest because not only are these um, serotypes very common in chicken, um, but they also are, are fairly common in among human cases of salmonella. And so we were taking a special interest in these serotypes and we saw them um, in the top, among the top serotypes in, in the, uh, both the rehang and in the post chill samples. Okay, so I'm switching gears a little bit. I spent most of this talk talking about very broadly about raw poultry as a whole, but we also are taking a special look at not ready to eat stuff bred at chicken products. These are, are products that um, you, you'll see in, in the frozen aisle. Um, they often look ready to eat, but they're not ready to eat. They're, they contain raw chicken, but because the, the product is breaded, it has the appearance of a ready to eat um, product. And um, because of that appearance, um, we unsurprisingly see a number of outbreaks associated with this. We've, we've actually um, investigated um, eight, 14 outbreaks um, of, of, of associated with these products since 1998. And, and we also know from investigations and talking to case patients that it's not unusual for consumers to product, put these products in, in, in microwaves and cook them um, using methods that aren't insufficient um, to destroying salmonella. And so um, despite efforts with, among the industry to improve the label and make the instructions really clear and obvious, um, consumers time and time again will improperly cook these products and become ill as a result. Our most recent outbreak um, was in 2021. So, um, so we're still from time to time seeing these outbreaks. And because of all of this, because of this public health burden, we have uh, decided to uh, propose um, declaring salmonella and adulterant in these products at, at lower levels than what we, we envision declaring for raw poultry in general. So this month we plan to publish a notice in the Federal Register that um, explains this proposal. We will be seeking public comments um, and we will also request suggestions for a final implementation plan, including a verification testing program. Once published, we will post a link to the notice on the FSIS website so that you can go directly to the FRN and, and review and comment. Um, we will also make an announcement in the constituent update when this happens. When the proposal is final, or if the proposal is final, um, we will announce the implementation plan and the date that will begin. Um, we will be we will begin routine testing for salmonella in these products. All right. So now, um, as I'm heading towards the end, I'm going to touch on three cross-cutting issues that um, have come up in, in discussions about our contemplated framework. Um, the first is testing for salmonella. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our ability to measure levels of salmonella is, is strongly tied to our ability to enforce finished product standards. And there's no doubt that we will need a method for doing this that is highly reliable and fit for purpose for our high throughput regulatory lab system. And so we're continuing to review the data from the enumeration technology that we're currently using to ensure that we have a method that will provide the best information for, for decision making. Um, so that's an ongoing process. I just want to make that point. Um, we, we still need to make sure that we have a method that will allow us uh, to quantify accurately. Um, of, of course, another concern is how small and very small establishments will um, handle any potential changes. And we understand that low volume producing establishments have resource constraints that differ from larger volume establishments that tend to be vertically integrated. We are looking into how to account for production volume 
another additional options uh, to factor establishment size into our proposal. But ultimately, our standards and requirements will have to apply to all establishments, regardless of size. And then finally, another point um, is data sharing. So we're considering developing a process for establishments that perform their own sampling and testing for salmonella and other indicator organisms um, to regularly share this data with FSIS electronically. And this data sharing would allow FSIS scientists to develop tools and processes that aid um, our implant and personnel and um, our, our policy developers um, to, to monitor trends and identify food safety issues would also help us prioritize our resources um, and also help us enhance evaluation and refinement of our inspection systems and procedures and just bottom line, support future policy development. So all of that is also uh, being discussed and, um, and I'm sure that that will be all clear once we have something ready to propose um, for public comment. Okay, so I said a lot and um, I need to drink some water. Um, so I guess I'll stop now and see if there's any questions. The first question is about um, the human incidence of salmonella and um, whether or not we've overlaid that, um, that, that incidence curve with the per capita consumption. And that's a great, great question. And that's one of the, the thoughts um, that, you know, I'm sure a lot of us um, here at FSIS are entertaining us is that maybe that, that's why um, the line, um, the flat, the food net curve is flat is because although we've made strides in reducing contamination, um, it's masked by the fact that more and more people are eating uh, chicken and coming in contact with raw poultry. Um, it's really hard to definitively answer that though without um, more data, but if we have a, we can't rule that out, right? So I think we just have to keep an open mind about that. But I, I would say, you know, kind of as an epidemiologist, you know, um, the fact that exposure um, is increasing and, and that could explain why we're not, we're not seeing a, a decline in, in, in human illness um, despite um, improvements to contamination. It's still, it still, it doesn't kind of absolve us from, from taking action and, and seeking improvements because again, like, you know, the public health burden is the public health burden. So although we should, should consider that, um, you know, we, we've had some effectiveness in improving, um, you know, foodborne salmonella infections. Um, we we still um, probably need to do more, right, um, to mitigate um, the 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 concerns that ex increased exposure are, are might present. Um, so the second question here is: Has FSIS developed a test for serotyping that can return results within minutes? Um, and, and so you mentioned holding, um, you know, test and hold would, would be a, a big problem, especially um, on business, but also um, it has implications on animal welfare. And I totally agree with that. So um, one thing I didn't talk about is how closely we've been communicating and, and working with ARS, the Agricultural Research Service. We've let them know that we do need, um, you know, more rapid tests for serotypes so that you know, it can help drive decision making in the field, um, and and so that their their researchers there um, are are working on that as as we speak, um, and hopefully there'll be some assays that become commercially available soon um, that we can use, FSIS can use, but also the industry. Um, so you know, the the answer to that your question is ultimately. Um, we're working on it, but um, we don't have anything right now. Um, so that's that's kind of the challenge for us in terms of rulemaking is, you know, we, we don't have that method right now. So until we get that method, we're going to have to really, um, you know, think about how we we uh, draft our, our proposal. So we're not over promising. Um, and I think I think the industry, the, the diagnostic industry will 
um, rise to the challenge, but um, you know, we have to just be careful not to over over promise when we when we pro, um, propose. So we'll be thinking about that as well. Um, okay, so the third question is about multi-hurdle approaches by poultry slaughter establishments um, and how that may affect the salmonella recovery rate at post chill. Is this being evaluated? Another excellent question. Um, so, you know, we wanted to do um, some some data collection and get data from the industry. We actually, when we started this whole initiative, we put out a call for the industry to, to help us, um, um, you know, deconstruct this question that you've asked about how, um, you know, the different interventions that are used in these plants, how, um, what, what's associated with the, the best recovery. Um, we just never got um, that data from the industry. And it's really difficult for us to collect that because, um, you know, every time we collect samples, it, it, we have to go through, you know, the, this process of rulemaking when we want to kind of deviate from um, significantly from our, 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 our current slate of testing. So it's really hard for us to, to get that data. But, um, you know, I, I think, again, with our relationship with ARS and other researchers, um, Hopefully we'll get more insight into that. Um, we just know that yes, multi-hurdle approaches are very common, not just at um, slaughter plants, but also at pre-harvest. I think the industry recognizes that there is no silver bullet. They're gonna have to use a lot of different um, strategies to address salmonella um, and they're all doing slightly different things. So it makes it hard to know exactly what is the most effective um, you know, intervention, but but um, but it's a great question, and I think that's one for for researchers to to take on. Um, does chiller type of, appear to affect the proportion of samples? So um, so most of the industry uses your conventional chiller chiller types. I think there are a few that use um, air, air air chilling, um, and I don't I don't know if we've really looked at you know how that those differences affect. Um, our recovery, like if we see higher higher um, prevalence in one type versus another. Um, but I, I would think that, you know, for the chiller, chiller, the chiller tanks are attractive because you can um, readily apply, um, you know, chemicals to those tanks that um, have shown effectiveness in reducing microbial um, levels and, and prevalence. So I think that's one reason why they're attractive to the industry. Not only um, does it bring down the temperature of the birds um, in keeping with our regulatory requirements, but they also provide a means for providing um, those the antimicrobial um, you know, solutions to the, the carcass in a, in a pretty cost-effective way. Um, defining small and very small. Um, so it's, it's yeah, so basically there's kind of two different types of defining small and very small. Generally, we have like these rather outdated concepts of HACCP size, which was based on the number of employees. Um, and we've kind of moved away from using that, that definition. When we're talking about, you know, very small, usually we're looking at slaughter volume. And I don't know what it, the official cutoff is like in terms of annual slaughter val volume for these categories. But when you think about a large um, volume establishment, um, they, they produce millions and millions of birds, pounds of birds, right, every year. Very small establishments uh, tend to operate um, sporadically um, through the year. Um, if it's a, if a, a small turkey plant, they might only operate during the holiday period. So, you know, they're not producing a lot of product and they're not necessarily producing throughout the year. So those are the things that we look at when we, when we consider small and very small. Okay, um, lots of questions here. I hope I'm- okay, so let's, go, <clears throat> let's go with about two more questions. We had a lot of questions, but uh, in the interest of time, let's go with two more. Okay. And you pick or choose. Okay, so um, this question is about, um, I think, consumer education. So FSIS does have a, an, an arm that's dedicated to public um, affairs and consumer education. 
Um, CDC does a lot of work on consumer education. Uh, different different groups handle consumer education, and we recognize that that's definitely a, an important um, component of of food safety. Um, the unfortunate reality is is that there there's only so much messaging you can do, um, and a lot of times um, that messaging doesn't reach the right audiences, and so um, it def definitely requires um, us to to think creatively about how to how to really reach consumers so that they know, you know, temperatures that they should be cooking products at, and, you know, um, safe handling in the kitchen and things like that. Um, but, but yeah, I think, I mean, it's an, it's an important thing to be looking at. And, and then and the next question is kind of similar on that theme. I think we need to partner with others to think about, you know, in the modern, in the modern era with social media, could we do more uh, to promote consumer awareness and education, I, I, I say yes. Um, that's an important um, important topic. And I, I agree, people are, are moving farther away from agriculture and to losing a lot of the the habits that their you know their grandmothers, their great grandmothers, um, you know, treated as a matter of course. And and so there there may be lapses in food safety in the kitchen because people um, are are losing touch with what, you know, used to work, you know? Um, okay, um, I'll take, I guess, maybe one more question. Um, Just go one, let's go one more and then uh, I'm gonna have to close, close the session. Okay. So the last question about, you know, One Health, does FSIS have regulatory to address um, any potential environmental mit mitigations for pre-harvest? And, um, and unfortunately we, we have limited authority to address issues at pre-harvest. Um, so that means that we, you know, using that One Health approach, we have to kind of use our collaborations with, with partner agencies that do have authority um, to look at environmental health concerns and, and either even do producer outreach um, using APHIS um, or F FDA as, as necessary um, to ensure that, you know, that, you know, we're not forgetting the environment um, with whatever we come up with. All right, wonderful. Well, once again, I, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Robertson Hale, for uh, a very uh, you're gracious in providing your time and providing uh, your the information uh, during the presentation. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Pettit for any final comments that she may have. I'll like I will uh, repeat that. Thank you very much for the awesome presentation. Uh, greatly appreciated. For the rest of you on the webinar, I uh, shameless plug as always, we are always looking for more good quality presentations. If you are interested or know somebody who you would like to volunteer, if you go to the acvpm.org webpage under continuing ed, there is a link uh, that says volunteer to present. Uh, fill out that form and you will be able to get in contact with us about a potential topic. Um, other than that, thank you guys very much, everybody, for joining us, and uh, 